the light, yeah. So, yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Whether you're in Zoom land or whether you're here in Federation Hall, a big hearty welcome to you to Art Forum. My name's David Sequeira. I'm the person who um, organises Art Forum and I'm also the director of the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to take a moment to invite you all to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people, and invite you to ground yourself in the deep, deep knowledge that for thousands of generations, um, the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people practiced song and dance on this country. They made paintings and sculptures shared stories, practiced healing, and those rituals and traditions continue today. So please join me with joy and honour in acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging. Now, today's art forum is slightly different to art forums, uh, to the art forum schedule, sorry, the art forum format that we normally have. Our guest speaker, Jamila McCune, is, is, McEwen is um, Australian based in New York, and it's is it about 10 o'clock in the morning, I think, 10 o'clock at night in New York, around that sort of time. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Jamila, okay? So Jamila McEwen is an interdisciplinary artist living and working in New York. McEwen was born in Scotland to Sufi parents and immigrated to Australia as a child, where their upbringing intertwined scientific, mythological and spiritual ways of learning from the land. McEwen is known for their intimately interwoven earthworks created through slow acts of physical endurance and meditation. McEwen cultivates kinships with landscapes and the communities of indwellers, regarding them as true collaborators who carry their own valid subjectivities, histories and messages. McEwen's work is empathetic to the psychological pressure of trying to reach into the past to regain control of future fraught with uncertainty. McEwen has performed and exhibited extensively internationally, including at Aros Museum Denmark, the Australian Consulate General Pioneer Works in New York City, the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts New York City, Skaftel Centre for Visual Arts in Iceland. In 2022, McEwen was awarded the NYSCA NYFA Fellowship in Architecture Environmental Structures Design and the Victorian College of the Arts Philip Hunter Environmental Art Fellowship. Whether you are in Federation Hall or in Zoom land, please join me in making Jamila very, very welcome. Thank you. Hi, um, hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, I just want to say before I begin, um, I also want to honour the uh, Indigenous ancestors of the land that I am currently on, the Lenape, um, who are still very currently active also in on this land, but in a different way to what we see in Australia. Um, I also want to thank the Philip Hunter Fellowship folk for granting me funding to begin the project that I am going to talk to you about today. Um, so, oh, hang on. my. Okay, so I do make long durational time-based works. Um, I'm going to show you just a few of them. Human Meteorite was a performance that went for 30 days. Dead Gods is an ecological process using live fungi that was alive for 60 days. And more recently in spring in New York, I did a performance called Seed Meditation for which I sat in the park from sunrise to sunset for 10 days. So for me, time, landscape, living entities, ecology, all of these things, the way they are intertwined is very much about the way that time and where time and process meet. So it's really the the nexus of my work is in that zone of process and time as it is unfolding. Um, 
So the Philip Hunter Fellowship uh, was awarded to me to begin a project called 12 Mountains. Um, I'm going to begin by telling you the story of how it, it came to be that I started this project because I think it's important. So roughly 11 years ago, when I first moved to New York City, a friend of mine was working for an artist, Yukon Taruga. On, on the last week that Yukon was living in New York, he invited uh, my friend and me and a couple of other people out to dinner uh, at a sushi restaurant in Soho. And at one point in the evening, Yukon told me a story that really changed me. He told me a story about his friend Yumi, who was from Okinawa but had moved to mainland uh, Japan and then had returned to Okinawa and became incredibly curious about this phenomena of the older people in this island being able to talk to mountains. Yumi became really determined to learn this ability of how to talk to mountains. And so she talked to lots of old people and asked them, how, how do you talk to mountains? I don't, I don't understand. And they were kind of like, oh, you know, it's not that good. You know, you, it's, it's not as good as you think. You don't really, you don't really want to talk to mountains. It's a blessing. Don't worry about it. But she, she kept pressing them and they said, look, it's, it's really just about listening. You know, if you, if you learn how to listen and pay attention, they'll speak to you. And this was the most frustrating information to her. It didn't, didn't seem to make sense. Until one day she was driving along the, a road in Okinawa. She was on her way somewhere, but she heard this, or she felt this tug, this kind of uh, pull on her. And noticing that the direction of this pull was coming from a, from a mountain to her left, she she wondered is you know is this it is this is this the communication and so she followed the pull that almost felt like just the pull of instinct you know more than like a, a loud voice she didn't know why she was being called there but but she felt the call and she showed up to the base of this mountain to the, just the parking lot that the other cars were in and um and she noticed there was some trash on the ground which in Japan is actually quite unusual if for anyone that has visited Japan, it's one of the cleaner places that I've been. But anyway, so she, on instinct, just picked up this trash. And as soon as she started picking up the trash, she felt the tone within her change. And it changed in this way that she felt both reprimanded, but also, um, you know, it was it was a tone of kind of a teacher scolding you, going, you know, it's about time, you know, that that sort of sensation of being rewarded but reprimanded at the same time. Anyway, so she kept picking up this trash and the voice or the sensation of a of an entity got louder and louder in within her as she did it until eventually she's she apparently spent about two hours picking up trash, hiking, picking up trash. Um and eventually she felt this feeling of like acceptance and you're released. You know, you can go now a dismissal. And on hearing this story, I really leaned in. It it seemed to awaken something in me personally where I was like, that seems, it's it was like being reminded of a distant memory. Um, and so it really it really stayed with me and it really changed me. Some number of years, and I and I did start this kind of practice of trying to listen. Some number of years later, I had my own encounter with the mountain spirit when I was working in Iceland on a film called The Wake. Uh, this film is about environmental grief. Uh, and I went to Iceland specifically because I had encountered strong um, animistic entities in Iceland before. And when I went there, I said, basically said to the place, I went with no plan and I said, I am struggling with this sense of environmental grief I have no idea how to overcome a sense of grief that is is ongoing and almost straight away I was delivered this inspiration of this film um, about giant teeth I actually had no idea what the story was even but image after image of scenes that I needed to film would come to me 
And at a certain point, I felt very kind of uh, exhilarated by this. Sometimes as artists, when we come in possession of creative inspiration, it can really give us a big ego boost. But so I had this sensation of like, oh, I'm doing something really brilliant. I'm going to get back to New York. Everyone's going to be like really blown away. And in that state, I found myself experiencing this intense voice coming through not as words but in the sound of wind but it was wind with a very sentient tone and the wind was really angry at me and uh and it felt like the the kind of anger if you angered someone that you really respected you know um like a, a mentor or a parent or something like that, or a grandparent actually. And so, and at first I was confused. I was disoriented by this sound of wind. But then as soon as I felt that tone, I awakened and I listened carefully. And this tone was reprimanding me for my attitude. And it was very acute in its explanation of its anger. And the anger was the anger very articulately communicated to me, but not in words, fully in somatic sensation. This, you came here and asked for this story. This story has been given to you because you asked for it and you need to take care to carry it through, but it is not yours and it is not for you. And you need to correct your attitude because you are working in this land and your attitude will be felt and then from there, the mountain gave me this vision of being in the ocean, in the fjords, um, and there I witnessed these whales. And the mountain communicated to me that the mountains aren't just above sea level. They extend all the way into the, into the fjords. And into the fjords, they have these relationships with the whales and the ocean. And it's their responsibility to take care of these whales but also that they reminded me that the whales are the ones that still communicate with the mountains through their sonar. So that song that the whales do that bounces off these surfaces of the mountains as they go down into the ocean, this whale song is felt by the mountains themselves. And so it's these kind of experiences that... Um, become the reason for why I keep making the work that I do. In the film, actually, at one point, I worked that experience into the film. And at one point in the story of the film, one of the teeth actually begins to speak to me and offers me words of condolence um, that I think were the words of condolence that I was experiencing from my time being in this landscape as well. So Jumping forward a few years, I learn of this incredible case, um, legal case, being mounted by a specific Māori iwi group in, I'm going to butcher this, Aotearoa, or otherwise known as New Zealand, where they had, where a specific iwi group, the Tiatiawa, had the imagination to recognise that our legal system already had animism built into it, in that we already recognised personhood in corporations. So the Te Atiawa proposed to the New Zealand government that Taranaki Maunga, um, Watangi River and <laughs> I've lost my note on this one, but also a forest whose name I don't have written in front of me, um, would be granted legal personhood. So this would be the first time in which we would see um, the envir any environmental entity given the same rights as a human being. I was so inspired by this story and I thought how... If we have the ability to recognise the personhood of these places could we also then listen to them could we list if, if we are going to give them rights could we also listen to them and if we could listen to them 
could perhaps these mountains speak to each other? Could we find a way for this message of personhood to actually transform our whole relationship to the environment around the world? Could could the word spread? Um, Taranaki is, this is Taranaki from the air. It's quite an unusual environmental site in that the, the ring that you see around Taranaki is a protected zone. So everything that is dark green, that is very dense um, virgin forest, essentially, and everything leading up to that is farmland. Uh, so it already has this kind of supernatural way in which it looks in the land. Um, but for what I learned when I visited Taranaki, this, what you also see there, so there is a protected zone, but it's also a severance zone. Taranaki's community of other living entities that are connected to this mountain only extends to that ring and then is otherwise severed. So in imagining Taranaki being able to speak to other mountains, I conceived of this notion of a council of mountains. So I imagined myself being able to stand with all of these mountains and listen to what they had to say and also listen to what they had to say to each other. As I started researching various mountains around the world and the communities of kin that connect with these mountains that also recognize them as people that also recognize them as um as as wise ancestors often i became really interested in the similarities and the differences between these perspectives and uh, and I imagined being in this space and listening to a, and and watching a kind of a debate or or a growing of not even a debate, really an expansion of a of a kind of a definition of of ideas that could be passed on by mountains. So I went about researching a range of mountains. At the moment, this is the this is the current shortlist. The way that I conceive of this installation. Um, they would be organised in terms of um, their north-south orientation and then also what what side of the globe they're on so that you would have this sensation of Earth's shadow actually moving through the piece so that anyone that was um, experiencing it would also experience how the mountains would experience time. So I imagine that a one one year for a mountain would be experienced as similar to one hour. So I set about this, this project of filming in time-lapse these 12 mountains for 12 months um, from equinox to equinox and then putting them in a room together like this. You would also in this installation experience the, the tilt of the seasons. So for instance, um, while the days would be short um, up in the north, they would be long down in the south and vice versa. And you would see the mountain caps become white and then uh, and then lose their snow. So you would actually really experience very um, viscerally the, the physical sensations of the mountains and then also the way that the clouds dance around them, which I will also show you in a, in a video in a minute. Um, so in mapping, I found many amazing candidates for this, by the way, many more than 12. But in in mapping my choices, um, I had to consider how globally spread they were and also um, their distribution in the northern and southern hemisphere. So the thing about the way that our planet is oriented is a majority of landmass is in the northern hemisphere. So it's actually been it's been kind of challenging to find a way to preference um, southern hemisphere mountains. And one of my dream mountains, if you see, there's a little dot right down in the right hand corner, is Mount Erebus, which is on the only um, landmass. Uh, continent, sorry, that does not have an indigenous population. 
And so I'm I'm actually really interested, this mountain specifically, I know a uh, volcanologist, Clive Oppenheimer, who has a very close kinship with this particular mountain. He loves it. He's spent a lot of time on it. It's a it's also it's a vol- volcano actually. Um and so he as a friend is very is kind of determined to find a way for Erebus to be included in this, even though it's quite challenging to film Erebus. And then I also just find it curious to have um either perhaps Erebus Erebus's voice would be silent or perhaps I would have my friend who shares a kin kinship with Erebus speak for the mountain so that is kind of jumping ahead to describing one of the aspects of this video installation is that the the mountains are able to communicate by proxy of their their human kin, their human um, communities. So because because these mountains already passed on so much knowledge, what what I plan to do in each location is to collaborate with the living kin connected to each site and have them delivered to the project or the 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 collective. Um, what communications do they feel like their their mountain um needs to bring to this council um so immediately once i received the grant from philip hunter i kicked into actually trying to solve the the technical aspects of this this project it's quite challenging to um set up long term time lapse outside without a very large budget um, and so I started working with a dear friend of mine, Harry Bailey, who is an incredible documentary maker. Um, when she started working on this, she had just come back from working on Blue Planet, uh, where she was in Alaska filming wolves and caribou. If you've seen Blue Planet, she did that. She shot that scene. She shot and directed that scene. So um, so she... she so this is one of these these moments where you need to bring in someone that really is an incredible expert. Harry attempted to find a way to um, build a rig from scratch, but eventually we we had to actually go with a um, with an existing company because we discovered that actually there are just so many um, challenges when it comes to this kind of remote operating camera setup. But it was a really quite fun and amazing learning curve with with them. Um, we also needed to find a location for our camera. So thanks to Google Maps, um, we found this cafe called Volcano View Cafe. If you need to set up a permanent camera outside, it's best to set it up on private property. Um, we just really lucked out with these guys. We also needed the camera to be south facing to not get sort of into the technicals of how that final installation works. The cameras all have to be facing uh, radial directions with each um, with each mountain. So actually the camera position is very important. Um, we were able to go to Mountain View where we met Lex and his amazing family, um, they are Dutch and they had set up this this cafe there and they were just so willing to participate. And this is one of those moments where, where a project really connects you to the community that, um, that are in the place and it becomes very personal. Uh, the person on the left wearing the blue hat is my partner Campbell, who was also assisting me on the project. The person on the right is Lex. Um, and then you can see, so in the first photo, they allowed us to drill into their ground to set a post that we could set the camera on and strap it to their house and helped every step of the way. And then, you know, afterwards, um, Campbell and Lex would go surfing. So really uh, enjoying the land and the ocean connected to it. So it really, it really felt very homely, this this trip this is this is Campbell precariously setting up the camera on their roof um the the thing on the left that you see is a Starlink um can uh satellite I don't know what satellite I don't know if that's what you call it but um interestingly 
this because this needs permanent internet connection um this is one of these things where you find yourself connecting to interesting technology that you'd never thought about but now i know a lot about starlink because of this um this is the camera pointing right at taranaki right above uh, lex's house um this is what the this for anyone that's kind of interested in this technology this is sort of like how you end up viewing it we take a photo every 10 minutes of of the mountain um let me just check my notes okay so i'm going to show you now a little bit of the footage of what we've managed to capture this is low resolution at the moment this is just uh with the the jpegs that we've taken we we are also taking 4k um, at the moment, we we actually started filming almost this time last year on the equinox on the 21st of September. And so um, eventually uh, we will um, we will work deeply into all of those 4K images and bring this up to a very high resolution version for the installation. But yeah, I just wanted to show you, you know, to see how beautifully you see the clouds and the sun and the stars dance around this mountain. The story of Taranaki is actually that he's very heartbroken and but he's very handsome. And so he when he's crying, he's hiding in the he's hiding in the clouds. And then when he feels proud and, and ready to be admired, he reveals his magnificence. So um, I felt very empathetic towards Taranaki's sorrow every time it was it was cloudy. Um, and, you know, this was also re just really exciting to sort of discover how, how active and how in motion and, and what, what, like I, I, I've watched 50 minutes of this stuff and like consecutive, we have 50 minutes. So far the final piece will be an hour and we're almost there. And it really, um, for me, I I feel like I start to get the sense of, of what it feels like to be a mountain <laughs> um, watching it. Oop. There's one more film. Uh, this one, I just want to show you this because it was quite beautiful. We managed to capture the aurora. So there's this. I think it's yeah so these these colors you see in the sky so there's this kind of magic when the project just happens to coincide with a very rare um uh uh what's the what's the word astro astronomical event um like the like the aurora I was actually lucky to be in a different mountain range when that happened the Tetons doing another project so the other half of this it's not just filming the mountain is actually working with the um the specific iwi groups that are connected to taranaki there's seven different iwi groups um the one that led the the case for personhood is the um tiatiawa as i mentioned and amazingly new zealand is or aotearoa is like one of the most amazingly accessible places this is the head office that's just in New Plymouth of the Te Atiawa and I was able to just walk in there and speak to someone about the, the work, which was, like, quite incredible. Um, so I feel like, in a way, uh, Taranaki has been one of probably one of the most gentle beginnings for this project because um, I, I felt very, like, at ease and welcome and um, the whole time when I was doing this work. By by kind of good fortune and digging in the local archive, I found this book that um of of uh of proverbs or they call them wataki or wataki um that struck me. There's a lot of there's a lot of books in tourist shops that are kind of like translation of Maori wisdom, and they're very touristy and they're very um. They're very like watered down and um and there was nothing I wanted to kind of 
get away from that. But I also found a lot of the books in the archive were very uh, academic. And what I was looking for was something in the middle, something that felt like meaty and like it was written by and for the people of Taranaki. And I stumbled across this book and uh, and this one proverb really struck me, um, where there are peaks, water flows. And you can see on the left the description about that, that this notion of water as being connected to knowledge and knowledge being connected to life, it was it really brought me into this so into such clarity of what it was that I was talking about of these high points of the land and why they're so wise is that they're connected to the sky and they're connected to the ground and and from them because they are high points they gather water and because they gather water they are able to create the entire communities that grow under them so literally everything that grows on the mountain grows under the mountain is that mountain's ancestor and this um this proverb really captured that i asked the archive to help me find where this book came from and um and there was they they looked up the address and just down the street I went to this place. There was no explanation in the book of how it had been created, but it turned out that it was a group that had been led by an organisation who worked with women who are uh, Maori women who were survivors of domestic abuse, and this was a project that they did collectively where they spent several months going out into um, the the Taranaki land and gathering all of these proverbs, these unknown proverbs, as a way to reconnect to their cultural ancestry. And so um, at the moment, because things are very slow with these kinds of communications, this is ultimately the, the source of the group of people that I would like to work with for this film, for, each, for the Taranaki film specifically. For each of the 12 mountain films, I actually want that film to be something that the community itself is able to take ownership of, to find their own use for, that um, that they can, that we're, we're kind of co, they're owners, but I'm a custodian. So it's like, I'll take the film and continue to carry it with the other films, but they technically have ownership of it and they can use it for their purposes. So, um, yeah, I guess time to wrap up, but this is basically the a few images of the final rendering of what I, I hope the installation will look like. Um, there's a few, There's I'm sure there's lots of questions that, because there's definitely a lot of things that I've missed in talking about, especially technical questions. But um, I have the very good fortune that another uh, dear friend of mine is, the um she's the indigenous liaison at the UN so she actually is the person that whenever a an indigenous delegate comes to speak at the the UN she facilitates that and she's also an advisor for um the tribal link foundation here in the US who um actually organize all kinds of connections between particular indigenous groups not in a sort of a UN public political way but just with one another and um and so she's helping me to connect with everyone um, that is related to these mountains. And she's also been a big advisor on, on even just selecting the mountains to begin with and their communities. Um, yeah, so I will leave it there. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in with questions or thank you so much. I'm right here, Jamila. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, Jamila? Can you just wave over? I can. Excellent. Yeah. It was um, so silent at your end, though. I, I assume it was on mute. But um, thanks so much, Jamila. And we we do have some time for questions. So I'm just going to turn the light on here, and we are going to do questions um, in a slightly different way because we're doing them via Zoom. So we have a roving mic, and Zamara, are you going to walk around with the mic? Great. So if you've got a question for Jamila, if you just raise your hand, the microphone will come to you. Yeah, great. Hi, Jamila. Uh, I've got a question for you. Thank you very much for your work, which is 
astounding and obviously very fruitful for anybody who hears what you have to say. Um, I noticed that in your map, uh, Australia had no flags on it. Did you have a candidate uh, which you had to let go of or haven't you found anything? And I'm, I, I, I'm asking because if anybody in Australia would like to engage in the same way that you are, not invade your practice, but maybe begin to engage with a mountain, uh, we'd like to know if there's one here we can go and engage with. Oh, you know, okay, so any, you can engage with any mountain. Um, whether they'll whether they'll engage back with you, it's it's up to them. But uh, there is there is someone that I know who is based in Castlemaine, who is doing a different. Who I connected actually to through this project, who's doing another project called um, I think it's called Three Peaks Speak, and and it's a really fascinating project, and it's very much. Um, a, a project that is is tracking this story the of um, the indigenous people that were connected to these sites, and then also kind of what happened throughout that process of colonialism. I'm I'm not hundred percent sure on the the exact details. I'm actually meant to speak to him a little bit further on that, but um, but I can dig out that information for anyone interested. The main reason I don't have um a mountain picked out in Australia is partly because of this want for a for a geographical spread um you know if there was one in the in western australia that would be that would be maybe a good candidate because it would be far enough away from taranaki that for the final sort of collection that but you know i would love to have one in australia because i find it really quite incredible thinking about how um the indigenous community of Aotearoa is the youngest indigenous community recognized indigenous community in the um on the planet and yet australia is is like potentially the oldest you know so it's it's to me the differences are so incredible and stark but I am also 100% open to nominations so I really love receiving emails from people with nominations for mountains and the that list of 12 has changed many many times so I welcome it. Thanks Jamila and thank you for the advice that we can pick any mountain we like because that's really amazing. Any mountain any tree any river have a go <laughs> just just have a listen. Just quickly, I have a mountain recommendation. <laughs> oh, please. Um, it's called Mount Gulaga in Bermagui. Um, it's of the UN people, so southern New South Wales. Um, and, yeah, I've spent a lot of time there. And it's very beautiful. It's shaped like it looks like a sleeping woman. And it's a place of um, significance for the, for the UN people for childbirth and um mm women gatherings yeah and thank you for your talk I really am very excited to see the the final product wherever it may be hopefully it can be somewhere in Australia <laughs> oh I I would love I would love for it to tour actually um to everywhere you know basically so it was Mount Gulaga G-U-L-U-G-A Gulaga G-U-L-U-G-A GA. Thank you so much. I will look. I will look into. I mean, one of my one of the most joyous parts of this is researching these places and the people. It actually um, sometimes people ask me because a, a lot of the time, really, my work is coming from this place of responding to um, the the emotional challenges of confronting climate change and things and the work that I do is actually the thing that uplifts me. So sometimes people are like, well, how can you look at this? How can you look at the state of our planet and be uplifted? But it's actually these stories that uplift me because they absolutely restore my faith in humanity and these places, even though um, I'm always encountering every, every site that I go to, whether I intend it or not is a site of um, 
of ecological disturbance and quite often also then violence against Indigenous people. It's 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 astounding. But it was, but yeah, then the place persists and it's and that's inspiring. I think it has a lot of like old mining roads on it um, that you can walk on. Um, and they're quite, it's like sad how they cut through the mm. surface of the mountain. And um, it was given back to the Indigenous, to the UN community in 2006. So now it's um, completely just um, protected. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Yeah, just in the front row. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I've got a question about time, and it's because you have this fellowship, and I'm assuming that there's a kind of a time frame within which it's supposed to be completed, and yet you're embarking on something that requires all of this close consultation with Indigenous groups around the world, and I imagine that time needs to go really slowly there and carefully and how do you balance these incommensurate things and do you have a an idea of when this will be finished or is it going to be able to unfold in its own time yeah the the latter um i okay so my attitude to deadlines um is that things things take the time they need to take and quite often when you kind of calmly state that to people they they understand that they realize that um that their deadlines are somewhat arbitrary um I did you know I did go in with the full ex you know anticipation that it is possible perhaps to finish something to the deadline that someone has set for me and quite often I do have follow through because I have more control over whether something's complete, especially if the only active participant is me or if it's season specific. So so for seed meditation, for instance, I was like, it's going to happen in these 10 days in spring. Or um yeah, this this one though, I I am actually very much enjoying the process of how slow the conversations are. I really appreciate the way that it pushes against um, what I think is a very um, pointlessly stressful attitude towards how long something should take. My my sense is the the thing with the entire project, so, so what's nice about being able to complete individual projects is like at this point now that I'm I'm almost finished with the filming, um, and I will be, I, the next part is really just working with the Maori. Then it's like, it's kind of up to them how soon they would like it to be finished, which, which feels nice. So, you know, so maybe they have a sense of urgency that they might need it for something. Um, so rather than me pushing it, um, I can keep it, I can keep it with some momentum, but also like, it's ultimately up to them. The entire thing, um, is a lot of the time on that is going to be dependent on my ability to get the funding that I need for each site. So Taranaki is actually one of the most kind of affordable and simple sites for me to approach. But for instance, if I'm going to do Erebus in Antarctica, I probably need to find some way to jump onto a volcanology grant that someone else is submitting from a university and kind of they convince the granting body that's giving them research money that they need time-lapse footage. So there's there's a lot of sneaky ways in which I might have to get, like collaborate with the scientific community to be able to get the, um, the recorded material that I need. Um, but the Indigenous conversations or the conversations with people at the sites, once I know that I want to be working with a site, I can begin that before I start actually filming. So... And that's kind of what's wonderful about having my friend Nina, who from the Tribal Link Foundation, because she's really able to help me initiate these conversations. 
Having said that, it is much harder to do these conversations remotely. There is a certain trust and intimacy that is only possible in person and things things move more uh, organically and naturally when you are in person and, um, yeah, emails tend to slow things down. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. We've got another question here. Well, we might leave it there. Jamila, um, thank you so much for taking us through that project. Like it's such a um, poetic and complex and layered project and um, just congratulations on that. And uh, while I'm saying that, a big shout out to everybody involved in the Philip Hunter Fellowship um, here at the VCA. Um, thank you for making that happen. Um, the only thing left for me to do is say goodbye and thank everybody in Federation Hall and in Zoom land for joining us today. And um, thanks again, Jamila. Please uh, join me wherever you are in acknowledging Jamila. And we'll see everybody back for Art Forum 1215 next Thursday. Cheers. <laughs>